Hi everyone, welcome to the December 2023 edition of Archaeology News, where we go on a journey through time to explore the latest discoveries from the world of archaeology. I'm your host Rachel, and I have taken my years of experience as an archaeologist and used it to spend hours carefully researching, filming, and editing this video so that you can have well-sourced and interesting accurate news that's not just clickbait or thinly disguised conspiracy theories. Did ancient people cut off parts of their fingers as a part of rituals to their gods? Were the people living in Neolithic mega-settlements in Moldova and Ukraine mostly vegetarian? Did the Sarmatians really come all the way from southern Russia to Britain during the Roman period as portrayed in the 2004 film King Arthur? Stay tuned to find out as I delve into the past with in-depth analyses of these captivating stories. Don't forget to take a few seconds to subscribe or like to help support me in keeping the channel going and tell the algorithm to promote it to new viewers. Every little bit of engagement helps. Okay, everyone, let's dig in. We have nine stories today in our top discovery segment, which I will cover in chronological order, starting from those farthest back in time. We begin with a new theory on why some handprints in Paleolithic cave art seem to have missing finger digits. In a paper presented at a recent meeting of the European Society for Human Evolution, researchers discussed 25,000 year old paintings in France and Spain that depict silhouettes of hands. On more than 200 of these prints, the hands lack at least one digit. In some cases, only a single upper segment of a finger is missing, in others, several digits are gone. In the past, this was attributed to artistic license by the painter or real life medical problems resulting in finger digit loss like frostbite. But now, scientists led by archeologist Professor Mark Collard say the truth may be far more gruesome. They argue that there is compelling evidence that these people had their fingers amputated deliberately in rituals intended to elicit help from their gods. Interestingly, the habit was not unique to one time or place, as in modern day, there are still societies that encourage fingers to be cut off, such as the Dani people from the New Guinea Highlands. In their culture, women sometimes have one or more fingers cut off following the death of loved ones. The researchers of this new paper believe that the Europeans were doing the same sort of thing in Paleolithic times. This theory is not new, as it was first published a few years ago. At the time, it received heavy criticism, and it was argued that the amputation of fingers would have been catastrophic for the people involved. Since then, Collard, working with PhD student Bree McCauley, has gathered more data to back his amputation thesis. Their latest research found more than 100 instances of the unusual finger drawings across Europe, Africa, Australia, North America, and Asia. They think that this practice was clearly invented independently multiple times, as well as being engaged in by some recent hunter-gatherer societies, meaning it is entirely possible that the prehistoric people engaged in this practice as well. Continuing our prehistoric theme for this month, an international team have uncovered fortified prehistoric settlements in a remote region of Siberia, revealing that hunter-gatherers in the region constructed complex defense structures around their settlements 8,000 years ago. The team of researchers conducted the fieldwork in 2019 at the fortified settlement of Amya, the northernmost Stone Age fort in Eurasia. During their work, they collected samples for radiocarbon dating, confirming the prehistoric age of the site, and establishing it as the world's oldest known fort. New paleobotanical and stratigraphical results showed that inhabitants of Western Siberia led a sophisticated lifestyle based on the abundant resources of the taiga environment. Approximately 10 Stone Age fortified sites are known to date, with pit houses and surrounded by earthen walls and wooden palisades, suggesting advanced architectural and defensive capabilities. This discovery challenges the traditional view that permanent settlements with defensive structures only emerged with farming societies, thus disproving the notion that agriculture and animal husbandry were prerequisites for societal complexity. This finding, along with other examples like Gobekli Tepe and Anatolia, reshapes our understanding of early human societies, challenging the idea that only with the advent of agriculture would people have started to build permanent settlements 
with monumental architecture and have developed complex social structures. Our next discovery also comes from prehistoric times where a study has revealed that Europe's prehistoric mega settlements ate a primarily vegetarian diet. The paper published focuses on mega settlements that arose from around 6,000 years ago in the territory of modern Moldova and Ukraine. These large planned settlements covered areas of up to 320 hectares in size and housed around 15,000 people, leading many researchers to argue that they were the earliest cities in Europe. The existence of these sites also raised the question of how they supplied their residents with food. It had previously been assumed that these large communities relied on subsistence farming. However, questions remained about how such large groups of people could ensure their nutrition with Neolithic technology. To find the answer, paleoecologists looked at the carbon and nitrogen isotope composition of hundreds of samples from the bones of humans and animals, as well as charred crops. High nitrogen-15 values came mostly from the megasites showing that they depended on pulses cultivated on strongly manured soils. The resulting food models indicate a low proportion of meat in their diet, roughly 10%. The rest of the crop-based diet was balancing calories and indispensable amino acids. They came to the conclusion that a large proportion of the cattle and sheep were kept in fenced pastures and their dung was used to intensively fertilize peas. This hypothesis is supported by studies by the University of Kiel, which determined that farmers in this area relied primarily on a diet of grains and peas 7,000 years ago. These two foods provide nutritional value to the human diet, and furthermore, the resulting pea straw likely served as feed for the livestock grazing in the pastures. According to the study, the close connection between crop production and livestock farming provided a balanced enough diet that the labor-intensive and resource-consuming co production of meat was largely eliminated, meaning the diet of these ancient peoples was almost, not quite, but almost, exclusively vegetarian. Now we head out of the Stone Age and into the ancient period of China, where a four courtyard style palace complex from the Zha dynasty has been discovered in Jinmi in Henan province. The Zha were the first of many ancient Chinese ruling houses. This discovery comes from the Guchengzai site on a plateau east of the Zen River. From 2021 to 2023, archaeologists conducted systemic surveys and targeted excavations in both the inner and key outer areas of the site. Their findings include a rammed earth foundation structure they believe to be part of the city's ancient palace compound. It measures 60 meters long and 30 meters wide, covering around 1,800 square meters. It is high at the center and low at all four sides, with a flat surface and rows of column holes evenly distributed along it. On the eastern side of the site, Archaeologists have also found another rammed earth relic. Currently, only part of it has been unveiled, measuring approximately 25 meters in length and 10 meters in width. It is believed to belong to the same architectural complex as the first rammed earth platform. This has led to the conclusion that the central eastern area of Guchengzai is the core palace zone of this site. These new findings could improve our understanding about the layout of ancient cities and provide important evidence for studies on the origin and development of Zha palace buildings. Our next discovery takes us to Mesopotamia, where a study of 3,000-year-old bricks has given new insights on a curious surge in the strength of the Earth's magnetic field. Spanning a period of roughly 500 years, traces of this perplexing phenomenon have been found from China to the Atlantic Ocean, and they start to stand out more the closer they are to Iraq. Until now, however, Evidence from Iraq itself has been scarce and poorly dated. This discovery was made using archaeomagnetic techniques to extract information about the strength and direction of the magnetic field of the Earth from ancient mud bricks. The researchers analyzed baked bricks containing iron oxide and inscribed with the name of one of 12 kings, presumably the ruler at the time at which they were made. They were able to obtain a ratio between the object's magnetic charge under laboratory conditions and in the past by methodically removing the ancient magnetic signature from small fragments of the bricks and replacing the magnetic field with one created in the laboratory. Don't ask me exactly how they did this or how it works because it's not my field of specialism, but it's pretty flipping cool that they can do that. 
The results showed that these bricks were fired at a time when the Earth's magnetic field was more than one and a half times what it is today. This establishes a baseline for the use of archaeomagnetic analyses as an absolute dating technique for archaeological materials from Mesopotamia. The potential of using this method for dating has already been immediately beneficial. There are detailed records of the order of the Twelve Kings and the length of their reigns, but debate continues as to when the sequence began and ended. Here, the team provided support using their methods for one of the competing timelines. By comparing, the field recorded in the bricks with those measured using other dating techniques. Just imagine what more they could do next. I think there will soon be lots of new dates and discoveries coming from the field of archaeomagnetics. Our next discovery is from where else but Pompeii in Italy, where archaeologists have uncovered the remains of a bakery where enslaved people were imprisoned and exploited to produce bread. The bakery had small windows barred with iron and was part of a home that was found during excavations in the Regio 9 area of Pompeii. The home is believed to have been undergoing renovations when it was destroyed by the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 CE. It was divided into a residential part that was adorned with lavish frescoes and the bakery, which was cut off from the outside world. The only exit led to the main hall of the house. The remains of three people were found inside one of the bakery's rooms. Markings used to coordinate the movement of enslaved workers and blindfolded animals were found on the bakery's floor. A series of semicircular indentations can be seen in the volcanic basalt paving slabs around the millstones. Given the robust durability of the material, it's likely that what at first a glance appears to be hoof or footprints are actually deliberate carvings made to prevent the draft animals from slipping on the pavement. And while they were doing so, they simultaneously traced a path and the wear on, that can be now seen on the various indentations can be attributed to the endless cycles of their work. This discovery provides more evidence on the daily life of Pompeii's enslaved people, often forgotten about by historical sources, but who made up most of the population of the city and whose hard labor propped up the city's economy as well as the culture and fabric of Roman civilization. An exhibition called The Other Pompeii, Ordinary Lives in the Shadow of Vesuvius, which is dedicated to the enslaved people of Pompeii, began at the archaeological park on the 15th of December, 2023. Now we cross the Atlantic Ocean to the US and the discovery of astronomical carvings and paintings associated with the Pueblo culture. The discovery was made at the Castle Rock Pueblo settlement complex located on the Mesa Verde Plateau on the border between Colorado and Utah. The Pueblans were an early Native American civilization that emerged around 100 CE. Their culture was one of the most advanced pre-Columbian societies, constructing multi-story stone houses, rock art, intricately ornamented jewelry, and ceramics decorated with painted motifs. Based on reports from the local community, archaeologists began exploring the hard-to-reach areas of the Sand Canyon, Graveyard Canyon, and Rock Creek Canyon in the area. At a height of around 800 meters above the cliff settlements, the team found the petroglyphs on rock panels that stretch over four kilometers around the large plateau. Spirals up to one meter in diameter were carved into the rock. It's thought that they were used by the Pueblo people for astronomical observations to determine the summer and winter solstices, as well as the spring and autumn equinoxes. Also found were painted depictions showing images of warriors and shamans, which date from the 3rd century CE during the basket maker era. These discoveries have rewritten our knowledge about this area and have shown that we have underestimated the number of inhabitants who lived there in the 13th century and the complexity of their religious practices. I have a personal connection to our next story, which brings us to Cambridgeshire, England. In 2017, I worked for two months on the A14 Cambridge to Huntington Road scheme as an archaeologist. It was a massive project with several sites dotted along its length. While the fieldwork finished in 2019, the scheme has continued to yield exciting discoveries during the post-excavation analysis, as is the case here, where ancient DNA work has revealed that skeletal remains found just outside the village of Offord Clooney belong to a young man of foreign origin. Specifically, he came from a nomadic Iranian-speaking group called the Sarmatians, who lived in an area that is currently comprised of southern Russia, Armenia, and Ukraine. This discovery lines up with texts by Roman historian Cassius Dio, 
that say in 175 CE, Emperor Marcus Aurelius drafted Sarmatian cavalry into Roman legions and deployed 5,500 Sarmatian soldiers to Britain. These records form the basis of the Sarmatian hypothesis from 1978, which suggests that the British Arthurian legend has a historical nucleus in the Sarmatian heavy cavalry troops stationed in Britain, and upon which the plot of the 2004 movie King Arthur featuring Clive Owen and Keira Knightley is loosely based. But that is where the connection between the movie and, and real life ends. In reality, little is known about where the Sarmatians were stationed in Britain, and no archaeological evidence connected with the actual historic event has been identified until now. The analysis of the bones of this young man shown Caucasus and Sarmatian-related ancestry in the whole genome, and no traceable ancestry related to local populations in Britain. Radiocarbon dating showed that he died between 126 and 228 CE, so right within the right time period. Stable isotope analysis of his teeth showed a life history of mobility during childhood. Until the age of six, he ate millets and sorghum grains. Then, as he grew up, there was a gradual decrease in his consumption of these grains and more wheat, which is found in Western Europe. This demonstrates that he, not his ancestors, made the journey to Britain. We don't know if he was a cavalryman, a cavalryman's son, or a slave, but regardless of the factors behind his migration, these results are the first biological evidence of Sarmatians in Britain and also highlight the long-range mobility facilitated by the Roman Empire. Our last discovery for this month takes us to Mexico, where archaeologists have found a hidden Maya burial chamber concealed within a cave at the archaeological complex in Tulum. The discovery was made during routine clearing work for a new visitor path. Upon removing the rock that sealed the entrance to the cavity, it was observed that it was literally splitting the skeletal remains of an individual in half, leaving the lower part of their body outside and the upper part inside the cave. This would indicate that the person might have become trapped while attempting to access the cavity. Inside the cramped cave lay eight adult burials remarkably preserved by the cool, dry environment. In addition to the human remains, a large number of animal skeletons associated with the burials were also found. Some of the animal bones even have cut marks and others have been worked as artifacts. A single ceramic grinding bowl helped date the burials to the late post-classic period, which occurred from 1200 to 1550 CE. The archaeologists described the conditions inside the cave as particularly difficult, owing to the small entryways, low ceilings, and lack of natural light, general heat, and humidity. In addition to photos, a three-dimensional scan of the area will be made so that researchers and the general public can see the materials and remains in their original context. That's it for our top discoveries. Which one was your favorite? Let me know in the comments. Mine is a tie between the Sarmatian DNA and the archaeomagnetic dating of bricks. If you enjoyed this segment, don't forget to like the video. Now we're going to move on to current news and events. First up is an appeal to the public for financial help to save Sweden's most popular tourist attraction, the 17th century Swedish warship Vasa, in order to ensure its long-term preservation. On display since 1990, the ship urgently needs a replacement support cradle and a new internal support skeleton. The estimated cost of this support structure is 11.8 million pounds. Since it was raised from the protective brackish waters of the Baltic Sea in 1961, it has had an active afterlife and attracted more than 1 million visitors per year. Vasa's preservation problems are caused in part by its steel cradle, which it has laid in since 1964. The cradle is putting too much pressure on the ship, creating cracks and deformations. Another factor is the wood, which is being chemically broken down from within by the pollution it absorbed while in the sea. But perhaps the most challenging element of the renovation process, which is due to start this spring, is that all of the work needs to be carried out while keeping the ship completely still and also while keeping the museum open. The museum team have already been researching for four years how to do this entire project. The build is estimated to take around four years. As we saw at the beginning, the project is coming in at a substantial cost which is why the self-funded museum is appealing to donors and sponsors to help finance it. I've put a link to the support page up at the top and in the description of this video if you'd like to contribute to the restoration project. Next is a letter calling for British archaeologists to unite and take the lead in the debate over the Stonehenge Tunnel. 
In July 2023, the UK Department for Transport approved the 1.7 billion 3.2 kilometer tunnel, saying its plan will remove the sight and sound of traffic and cut during times near one of its most famous monuments. However, the plan poses the risk that the monument will be delisted as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The prominence of Stonehenge in the national and global public stage means that the debate around the tunnel has drawn an unprecedented amount of attention and debate, and archaeologists have been overwhelmingly absent from this discourse. Many of the individual archaeologists and heritage specialists who are best informed on this subject are unable to comment due to factors which include their professional obligations. Basically, they're probably involved with the project, so they're under an NDA and at risk of losing their job, they can't publicly speak out about it in terms of their personal and professional opinions, whether they are for or against the tunnel. Meanwhile, many major organizations representing UK archaeology have distanced themselves from the heart of this politicized and polarized debate. Instead, the Stonehenge Alliance has driven much of the narrative via their campaign to stop the government's proposal. Their increasingly divisive and populist rhetoric directly risks the public understanding of archaeology in the UK. The letter calls for a powerful, evidence-based effort led by archaeologists to reframe the Stonehenge debate. It's been signed by over 1,000 archaeology and heritage professionals, including Professor Alice Roberts and Raksha Dave. I myself have signed it as well. If you're a UK-based archaeologist watching and would like to support this effort, you can find a link to sign it in the description. That's the end of current news and events. We'll close our program today talking about archaeology and entertainment and pop culture. We have just one entertainment story for today. Sorry guys, December is a bit of a slow news month, which is that Digging for Britain, presented by Professor Alice Roberts, has started airing its 11th season on BBC. The series focuses on archaeological excavations and research in the United Kingdom. Technically, it premiered on January 2nd, 2024, but I've included it anyway because, like I said, there wasn't really a lot else that I could find for this section in December. There are six episodes in this season featuring a Roman emperor's bathhouse, Anglo-Saxon gold, and a Norman panic room, among others. All right, everyone, time to pack up our finds and hang up our shovels for today. That's everything for the December edition of Archaeology News. Did you like this video? Is there anything important that I missed? Don't forget to comment, like the video, or subscribe to the channel before you go. If you are feeling extra generous, you can give me a super thanks or go to my Ko-fi page and support me with a small donation. Taking a few seconds to engage and support with my videos in any way helps the channel grow so that I can continue to provide you with quality heritage content that you can trust is well sourced, researched, and presented by someone who is an expert in this subject. Thank you so much for watching. Stay curious, and I hope to see you on my next adventure into the world of archaeology.